Welcome, everyone. I'm Mike Wick. I'm provost and dean of faculty here at St. Mary's College, and I'm, I'm pleased to welcome you all uh, to the, this year's uh, Reeves Endowed Chair Lecture. Um, we were expecting uh, Steve and Brad Reeves. I don't believe I see them here, but if they come in later, I'll, I'll make sure to uh, say something to them uh, during the uh, reception, which follows this immediately back here, where the sign says, don't touch, wait until after the talk. Um, so a little background on, on the uh, uh, George B. and William R. Reeves Endowed Chair in the Liberal Arts. It was established in 1997 by uh, the late uh, Wilma Reeves in memory of her husband. Uh, the chair recognizes and enables the scholarly work of a distinguished, eminent teacher-scholar with broad expertise in classical civilization. Jeff Hammond, professor of English, has held the Reeves chair since 2001. Jeff has taught British and American literature, biblical and classical literature, and creative nonfiction writing at the college since 1990. Jeff has a PhD in English and American literature uh, from Kent State University, and is an award-winning uh, writer and scholar. His current project, So You Say, Discourse and Presence in the Gospel of Mark, considers the gospel as a performance, a performative text, excuse me, simultaneously describing and changing reality. He got his start on that project while teaching himself Greek, which I just love. I can't even teach myself English. New Testament. Ah, well, then I'm not so impressed. I, on the personal side, uh, Jeff's annual uh, presentation is, is one of my favorite events at the college. Uh, his lectures are always thought-provoking and entertaining, and I'm looking forward to tonight. Tonight's program is entitled Draining the Inner Swamp, Learning as Resistance. You know, with liberal education under attack like never before, uh, it should be wonderful to hear Jeff connect today's political reality with the skills and values fostered by this oft-criticized but time-proven approach to education and the core of what we do here at St. Mary's College. Please join me in welcoming the George B. and William R. Reeves Endowed Chair in the Liberal Arts, Dr. Jeffrey Hammond. Thank you, Mike. Can you all hear me okay? okay. Um, again, thanks for a terrific introduction. And thank you all for being here. And thanks especially to the Reeves family, Steve, Brad, and Donna, who I hope to see them a little bit later, um, for their ongoing generosity to the college. They are continuing the legacy of their parents, George and Wilma, who had an abiding faith in the transformative impact of education. Now, I had the pleasure of knowing Wilma, and I can tell you that conversation with her was always a delight. I also want to salute another great conversationalist, the first holder of the Reeves chair, Professor Harry, Henry Rosemont, taught at St. Mary's from 1977 to 2001. He died last year at the age of 83 an internationally recognized pioneer in the undergraduate study of Asian philosophical and religious traditions, Henry was especially interested in the ethical and political dimensions of philosophy. Now, in light of St. Mary's mission as a public honors college, I actually think it would be irresponsible not to use this forum to address challenges to our mission posed by the current political climate. Given Roma's con commitment to education and Henry's passion for social justice, I'm pretty sure that they'd approve. But before I start, here are three important disclaimers. One is, I have a head cold. <laughs> if I seem to be weeping, I might be, but maybe I'm not. Maybe it's the head cold. Second disclaimer, um, a public lecture is not an institutional pronouncement. I'm not speaking here for the college in any capacity, official or otherwise. So if what I have to say bothers you, you've got only me to blame. My third disclaimer is that this isn't really a political talk, least of all a partisan one. 
Like everyone else, I have my political beliefs, and in the interests of full disclosure, those beliefs reflect being raised by New Deal Democrats in conservative small town Ohio. My father used to say that if Adolf Hitler and Prime Minister Tojo ran as Republicans, they'd still get 85% of the votes there. <laughs> Naturally, my parents got a lot of grief from friends and coworkers, but trust me, it was nothing like today's vitriol. Nobody ever called them Lion Sam or Crooked Gene. Clearly, something has gone wrong since then, and not just from a liberal perspective. For years, Norma and I have been friends with the DC couple. One is a conservative activist, and the other served in the second Bush administration. And these people are just as horrified by what's going on as we are. That's what I'm addressing here. Not political ideologies, positions, or strategies, but traits of the current president that alarm these lifelong Republicans as much as they do Norma and me. They're not alone either. Conservative pundits like George Will and Charles Krauthammer have expressed horror at the damage that this president has done to their movement. Mitt Romney once described Trump as a con man, and Arizona Senator John McCain has repeatedly called for a return to the politics of reason and compromise. And consider the recent book by Arizona's junior senator, Jeff Flake. Flake took his title, Conscience of a Conservative, from a 1960 book by yet another Arizona senator, Barry Goldwater. Goldwater was challenging his fellow Republicans. Now you'd think that the Phoenix water system contains microbes that spawn conservative dissent, except that George W. Bush has also weighed in. Quote, history or bigotry or white supremacy in any form is blasphemy against the American creed, Bush said, adding that, quote, we've seen our discourse degraded by casual cruelty. Beyond these Republican responses, people all over the world, especially long-standing allies, have been horrified by this swerve in our politics. I don't have to tell you that a lot of people at St. Mary's are horrified too. Since the election, many students have told me that they've had difficulty focusing on their classes. I can relate to that. A year after Trump's inauguration, and it's still hard to teach or study anything when you feel immersed in political chaos. We've heard a lot of post-election talk about resistance, about the need to get woke. I like that term. Deep down, haven't colleges and universities always been in the business of waking people up? Hasn't their mission always been political in the broadest sense? building responsible citizens by instilling the knowledge, skills, and character essential for a functioning democracy. Education is a vehicle for transmitting society's deepest values, and that includes resisting people, policies, and institutions that fail to live up to those values. Commitment to a liberal arts education virtually compels us to resist someone whose traits and temperament are antithetical to everything that the college stands for. To explain why, I'm going to submit Donald Trump to the St. Mary's test. I'll do so by discussing his record in light of four core skills that the college promotes. Critical thinking, information literacy, written expression, and oral expression. If we want to resist this person and his values, the honest pursuit of these skills constitutes a pretty good start. Who he is and is not might even inspire us to double down on who we are. Why did I just think of Marco Rubio? <laughs> That's a trivia thing. That's <clears throat> the first skill is critical thinking. 
the ability to look at facts and draw reasonable conclusions about, from them. It also means being able to evaluate conclusions that other people have drawn. Of course, this ability presupposes a respect for facts to begin with and for the effort that it takes to establish them. Our most conspicuous fact gatherers are journalists. I don't mean every news spinner who calls him or herself a journalist. I'm talking about respected news gathering organizations like the New York Times and the Washington Post, the very institutions that someone who dismisses facts will seek to discredit. When the current president dislikes something that these outlets have uncovered, he labels it fake news. At one point, his spokesperson, Kellyanne Conway, even asserted the existence of alternative facts. A St. Mary's education embraces alternative opinions and interpretations, not alternative facts. Lots of people besides journalists have devoted their professional lives to discovering and confirming facts. On campus, we call these people the faculty. Our professional work consists of establishing a factual basis for drawing valid conclusions in our respective fields. Anyone who has little regard for critical thinking will naturally dismiss our expertise. Such a person will lump us in with mainstream journalists and other so-called elites who think that we know better just because we've actually devoted the time and effort to learn something. This president has repeatedly shown an indifference to learning that would put him at odds with any school, not just ours. When he promises, for instance, to make America great again, he invokes a golden age when America was better. This brand of nostalgia ignores the expertise of historians. The facts that they've uncovered reveal an American past rife with social, racial, and economic injustices. So we have to ask, when was this golden age exactly? Was it the era of slavery? Was it the Great Depression or the World Wars? Was it when Trump and I were teenagers and young African Americans were risking their lives to make America live up to its ideal of liberty and justice for all? For a country that is genuinely struggling to live up to its ideals, a golden age can exist only in the future, never in the past. Critical thinking can also be applied, or not, to facts revealed by social and political scientists. Trump has repeatedly asserted, for instance, that people crossing our southern border are criminals who should be walled out. The facts reveal, however, that the vast majority of these people are running away from crime, fleeing homelands rent by drug violence, civil unrest, and official corruption, not to mention economic collapse. To stoke fear of them ignores the fact that far more crimes are committed by native-born Americans than by immigrants. When you demonize an entire group of people, you've replaced critical thinking with knee-jerk emotion. All kinds of faculty expertise can be ignored. Our economists will tell you, for instance, that globalism is simply realism, that it reflects the increasingly international nature of economics, communications, and politics in today's world. Despite this fact, the president vows to put America first by pulling out of existing trade agreements and calling for a return to protectionist policies that could trigger economic reprisals from our trade partners. Some critical thinking here might conclude that we need their cooperation and goodwill for our own economic well-being. But isolationism ignores this conclusion. And here again, history offers another inconvenient fact the extreme nationalisms that arose in the 19th century led to two world wars in the 20th. Then there's the president's campaign boast that he alone could get things done, 
that only he could drain the swamp in Washington. This assertion ignored the expertise of political scientists who understand that each of the government's branches, judicial, legislative, and executive, curbs the potential excesses of the other two. If the president truly understood and accepted this system, he would not have applied the label so-called to judges who ruled against the first version of his Muslim travel ban. Nor would he have presumed bias on the part of an Indiana judge because of his Mexican heritage. Unless, of course, Trump secretly hates Hoosiers. And, of course, there is the hard-won expertise of biologists, climatologists, and environmental scientists who've been warning us for decades about greenhouse emissions, carbon levels, and global warming. Ideally, a leader would look at this evidence and respect the conclusions that these scientists have drawn from it. Less ideally, a leader will dismiss their work and signal this dismissal by withdrawing from an international agreement on limiting greenhouse gas greenhouse gas emissions. Trump has even called climate change a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese. And why not? Didn't he get a lot of mileage out of promoting another hoax, that President Obama was foreign born? My point so far is that this president actively pursues a politics of ignorance, a politics grounded in the willful decision not to learn things. What could be more antithetical to what St. Mary's stands for, or what any institution of higher learning stands for? The fact that we learn things from sources brings us to the second core skill, information literacy. To see how Trump fares on this one, we need to return to our most obvious information gatherers, legitimate journalists. By legitimate, I mean those who are committed to maintaining the traditional journalistic separation of news from editorial, of fact from opinion. This distinction is embodied in the separate op-ed sections of mainstream newspapers. And when it gets blurred, we've gone from reporting to advocacy, from news to spin. Since the opening up of the radio bandwidth for further broadcast use, the rise of cable television, and the explosive growth of the internet, we've seen a staggering proliferation of outlets purporting to deliver news. The downside of this media explosion is that most of these outlets cater to specific demographics, to niche audiences. The increased competition for eyes, ears, and clicks also promotes popularity over objectivity, which drives sensationalistic modes of presentation. The niche marketing of news is a serious threat to our political health. It allows people to confine themselves to sources that share their ideology. No need to confront pesky facts or opinions that contradict their views. An immersion in spin can be avoided by applying the chief principle of information literacy, critically evaluating the sources that we use. Who owns or sponsors them? How often do they caught in, get caught in selective reporting, distortions, and falsehoods? Literate consumers of information will also counter spin by consulting a variety of sources and drawing their own conclusions. How does this president score on information literacy? From the sources that he cites and his admitted impatience with reading, we know that he prefers television to newspapers. From his comments, we also know that he prefers the niche appeal of cable news to mainstream network news. His comments also reveal that of the cable outlets, his favorite is Rupert Murdoch's Fox News, especially the morning show Fox and Friends. We also know that he is a longtime fan of alt-right websites like Breitbart, even to the point of bringing former Breitbart executive Steve Bannon into his inner circle. To the president, these and other ultra-conservative outlets deliver real news, that is, news that supports him and his positions. 
mainstream outlets such as the Times, the Post, and more recently CNN deliver fake news, namely news that challenges his positions. Trump has called this latter group the opposition party and more chillingly, the enemy of the people. The closest analogy for modern American history is the notorious statement that President Nixon made to National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger, the press is the enemy. Watergate reporter Carl Bernstein, who knows a thing or two about Nixon, recently observed that Trump's anti-media language, quote, may be more insidious and dangerous than Richard Nixon's attacks on the press. And it's true. Not even Nixon vilified the press so publicly and repeatedly. John McCain agrees, as he wrote in an op-ed that appeared in the Post just last week, only truth and transparency can guarantee freedom. The last two of St. Mary's four skills are written and oral expression. With written expression, we finally reached the bailiwick of an English professor. Actually, though, I'm at a disadvantage because the president does not write much. His books were ghostwritten, as are his presidential speeches. And though his campaign speeches were more spontaneous, they fall into the category of oral expression. Good writing is inseparable from careful reading, but again, this president is impatient with reading. He rejects detailed reports in favor of brief summaries, lists of bullet points, and graphics. Writing and reading play insignificant roles in his life. But while Trump doesn't write, the absence of writing carries its own significance. This is because writing is a tool of exploration as well as expression. As composition theorists know, writing helps us discover and clarify what we know and think. Since it's impossible to write well without knowing what you want to say, to work at your writing, to draft, revise, and revise again, is inevitably to work on your thinking. This process demands patience and curiosity. After all, you're trying to find out what you think. People who already know what they think won't have much patience with writing. Why clarify thoughts that feel perfectly clear? Writing will also be a chore to anyone who has little regard for what other people think. Because writing implies readers, it is an intrinsically social medium. Effective written communication requires social awareness and sensitivity, and the present's temperament does not lend itself to these traits. We have considerably more to work with when it comes to oral expression. It's with oral expression that the president's relation to language emerges most clearly. I'll include his tweets here. Twitter, given its brevity and immediacy, is more like an oral medium than a written one. And with Twitter, to cite Marshall McLuhan's famous mantra, the medium really is the message. It's a perfect medium for someone who is impulsive and easily distracted. Whether tweeting or speaking, this president does have a clearly identifiable verbal style, though not an especially clear one. I'm not just referring to vague words like huge, sad, bigly, or the now famous kofefi. I'm talking about his habitual use of sweeping generalities, vague slogans, and a vocabulary too limited to encompass the issues at hand. When speaking, he frequently loses track of syntax, and sentences end up as fragments. Specific details that might support or clarify a point are rejected in favor of repeating formulas and phrases. This degree of repetition even suggests a measure of defensiveness. Two of the president's favorite phrases are, frankly, and believe me. 
the classic tells of someone who might not be speaking frankly or believably. <laughs> Aware of the media hunger for sound bites, Trump speaks simply, dramatically, and usually hyperbolically. Everything that he and his people are doing, or intend to do, is described as great or beautiful. Everyone else is corrupt, or more generously, failing or sad. During the election, this was an asset. Trump's campaign appearances were not venues for persuasion, but pep rallies for the already persuaded. Drawing on a showman's instinct for bombast and theatrics, he gave his audiences not just what they wanted to hear, but how they wanted to hear it. Trump's oral expression as president, by contrast, has shown little situational or audience sensitivity. Though the shift from campaigning to governing required more measured and tactful speech, he cannot stop campaigning, a fact revealed in his continued attacks on both his defeated opponent and his predecessor. The ongoing rhetoric of campaigning fosters a degree of exaggeration and overstatement that is not helpful, especially when it comes to diplomacy. It can even be dangerous, as in his promise in response to North Korea's missile tests, that there will be, quote, fire and fury like the world has never seen. Was he really threatening a response greater than Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And how is world peace furthered by boasting that your nuclear button is bigger than the other guys? Effective expression, whether oral or written, also means telling the truth. From an ethical perspective, lying is the ultimate abuse of language, worse than all the kofefis in the world. This includes lies of omission, like refusing to provide tax returns, or failing to voice outrage at the white supremacist violence in Charlottesville. More often, however, Trump indulges in lies of commission. So many, in fact, that a new journalistic subgenre has emerged, fact-checking the endless flow of presidential spins, distortions, and falsehoods. Some of these lies are puzzling because they've been so easy to refute. Trump boasted of having the biggest inauguration crowd ever, despite the contrary evidence of aerial photos. When he gave the Boy Scouts a speech so blatantly political that scouting executives were forced to issue an apology, he claimed that scout leaders had called them to say that it was, quote, the greatest speech that was ever made to them. Now, the telltale phraseology here gave him away, but that didn't stop him from inventing another phone call, this time from the president of Mexico who supposedly praised him for firming up the border. Neither call happened, of course, as Sarah Huckabee Sanders was forced to admit. But that's no surprise. Fake phone calls have been in the president's arsenal for a long time. In his earlier days, he routinely phoned media outlets while posing as a fictive publicist named either John Miller or John Barron who heaped lavish praise on his boss. Now, once you detach language from reality, you need an exceptional memory to keep your stories straight. Candidate Trump repeatedly mocked President Obama for playing golf. But President Trump has outgolfed Obama by a mile, spending a quarter of his days at his golf resorts. Granted, this is a petty example, but the lying is a very big deal. It shows that being an educated person is not just a matter of skills, but also of values, including honesty, integrity, and humility. Here, too, Trump fails the St. Mary's test. To believe only what makes you feel good is to place an excessive premium on self-gratification. When your need for self-gratification becomes so powerful that you routinely, routinely project your private reality onto external reality, 
regardless of the fit. The result is epistemological narcissism. Not only will an epistemological narcissist see the world inaccurately, but he will see himself inaccurately. When, for example, Trump promotes himself as a business genius who has mastered the art of the deal, he is ignoring the objective reality of several failed casinos and at least six major bankruptcies. When he boasts of being a stable genius in possession of the best mind, he overlooks his gullibility in falling for the hoax that President Obama was foreign born. Multiple sources confirm that Trump even fudges his golf scores. But why shouldn't an excellent golfer that he believes himself to be take mulligans and, a and ignore a putt or three? Shouldn't a man's scorecard reflect his inner truth? A tenuous relation to truth betrays another dangerous flaw in a president, and that is impatience with complexity. This is, of course, a common human failing. After all, what makes hard things hard is complexity. But someone who is intellectually lazy will believe that things are simple and clear-cut because he or she needs them to be simple and clear-cut. This can breed impatience. Faced with a war going badly, as it has in Afghanistan, Trump publicly criticized his top commander there. Exploiting the dark appeal of xenophobia, he promised to build a beautiful wall and make Mexico, that criminal realm, pay for it. Ignorant of the complexities of our government, he pledged to, reveal the, to repeal the Affordable Care Act on day one. When the Republican effort to do so stalled in the Senate, he announced that he was disappointed in Senator Mitch McConnell for failing to achieve the impossible. Seeking to make political hay from Hillary Clinton's email gaffes, Trump bypassed evidentiary complexities and judicial processes by repeatedly bellowing, lock her up. And when Clinton was cleared of chargeable offenses, he dismissed this result as a whitewash. But when Russia, when the Russia investigation began to focus on his people and possibly him, he publicly criticized his attorney general for recusing himself instead of shutting down the probe. Trump has repeatedly called this latter investigation a witch, a witch hunt. But here again is that aversion to complexity. To a simplistic thinker, investigations are either whitewashes or witch hunts. There's nothing in between. When we choose ideology over evidence, the result is a mental rigidity that makes deep-seated insecurities hidden, or at least we try to hide them. If you're massively insecure, you might counter embarrassing leaks by claiming that your predecessor wiretapped your campaign. A shaky sense of self-worth might even prompt you to rig up some fake Time magazine covers to hang on the wall. And why not? It's that scorecard thing again. If anyone deserves to be on the cover of Time, it's you. This uneasy mix of fragility and arrogance can be so impulsive as to become physical. Trump physically shoved aside the Prime Minister of Montenegro when it was time for the group picture at a NATO conference. And at Trump rallies, some of his followers took his calls to rough up demonstrators, quite literally. Clinging to uninformed convictions fosters a lack of empathy for people who don't think like you or who are different from you. Despite hoisting the rainbow flag at some of his campaign rallies, the president surprised everyone, including the military command, by abruptly banning transgender people from serving in the armed forces. This pronouncement, actually a tweet, may have been intended as a distraction from the Russia investigation. Or it may simply have reflected the president's habitual disregard 
for factual evidence. In this case, the brave and effective service of thousands of transgender servicemen and women, both current and retired. Epistemological narcissism will also foster a lack of empathy for people who don't look like you. If you're a young real estate developer, this lack will prompt multiple anti-discrimination lawsuits against you. Later on, it will prompt you to take out ads calling for the execution of the Central Park Five, four black kids and one Hispanic kid who were accused of rape but later exonerated. When you run for office, you will claim that, quote, the blacks love you. At a luncheon celebrating African American History Month, you will praise 19th century abolitionist Frederick Douglass as, quote, an example of somebody who's done an amazing job and is being recognized more and more, I notice. You will spend years promoting birtherism despite the racist overtones of the claim. Nor will you see racism in your sweeping pronouncement that Mexican immigrants are bad hombres. You will resist disavowing the racist, anti-Muslim, and anti-Semitic groups that support you. Some of them, you'll insist, are very fine people. By contrast, you'll call Haiti, El Salvador, and several African nations shithole countries during a discussion of immigration reform. If you're equally clueless about your immersion in sexism, you will brag about groping women who let you do it because you're a star. You will endorse a sexual predator from Alabama when he runs for the Senate. You'll turn a diplomatic meeting into an opportunity to comment appreciatively on the appearance of the French president's wife. Carly Fiorina and Mika Brzezinski might get a thumbs down, but so what? Isn't judging a woman's appearance a man's birthright? Ditto for how women behave. When a female journalist asks you some hard questions, you'll suggest that she must be menstruating. This kind of mind can shift eff effortlessly from defaming groups to defaming individuals. If you're a narcissist who craves simplicity, you can reduce just about anyone to a demeaning label. Lion Ted, Lil Marco, Loser Mitt, Low Energy, energy Jeb, Weak Jeff Sessions, and of course, Crooked Hillary. You'll even call an unpredictable foreign leader Little Rocket Man. After the publication of Michael Wolff's book on your dysfunctional White House, you'll demote former ally Bannon to Sloppy Steve. You'll even disrespect John McCain's five and a half years as a prisoner of war because he got caught. So how did someone so lacking in the knowledge, skills, and values of a St. Mary's education become the President of the United States. I think it resulted from a weird triangulation, an imperfect storm of three key factors. The first was a widespread animus against Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, an animus so unreasonable and extreme that it clearly reflected sexist and racist motives. The second factor was dissatisfaction with the status quo on the part of white working class voters, especially in the Rust Belt. I grew up with these people, which is why I took the election so hard and so personally. It wasn't that a Republican had beaten a Democrat. I grew up seeing that all the time. It was that basic American values, respect, fairness, playing by the rules, had been beaten by raw anger. Growing economic inequity finally hit white Rust Belters who had always denied the existence of economic inequity. But instead of trying to understand their situation, they turned to a rich celebrity who promised to bring their jobs back. Even coal mining jobs destined to play a diminished role in energy production anyway. 
The third factor was the rise of politics as entertainment. As a media star who made a fortune by playing a reality show version of himself, Trump understood the irresistible appeal of pop culture. Given this appeal, a successful political campaign could be based simply on being entertaining. And he was. The fact that Trump made for good copy and high ratings explained why he received far more coverage, especially on the cable news outlets, than Clinton did. In ordinary circumstances, most of that coverage would have been damaging or even fatal. But remember, in showbiz, there's no such thing as bad publicity. The deepest irony of the election is that Trump never really entered the world of politics. Instead, he dragged politics into his world, a world that he shares with the Kardashians, World Wrestling Entertainment, and those Duck Dynasty guys. The Apprentice promoted a fantasy of the business mogul as guru. For many voters, it was, small, it was a small step to embrace the big business mogul as savior. When this TV personality moved from the media world to the real world, the aesthetics of charisma fostered by reality television morphed into the politics of charisma. And here we are. I began this talk by alluding to resistance. The pursuit of activism, organizing, educating, promoting voter registration, and contacting elected officials this constitutes the most obvious form of this resistance. Such activity has been ramping up everywhere, even in my native Trump country. But in a profound sense, we are already resisting this president simply by being here and taking seriously what St. Mary stands for. When viewed against the backdrop of this president and his worldview, learning is itself an act of resistance. Respecting facts and thinking critically about them are acts of resistance. So are cultivating social and environmental responsibility, embracing a diverse community of students, faculty, and staff, respecting multiple viewpoints, and thinking for ourselves. A commitment to these things, not a play commitment, but a real one, will show this president that there's another way to inhabit the world, another way to be. It might also help create a critical mass of citizens who will never, ever make this mistake again. One of the stated values of St. Mary's College is civility. This calls us to resist the urge to demonize Trump's supporters. Doing that would deny the human capacity to learn and grow, which would be tantamount to denying the value of education itself. Of course, we can and should write off as deplorables, to use Clinton's unfortunate word, the hardcore haters and racists, the David Dukes and Richard Spencers who have repeatedly praised this president. But the sheer number of Trump votes suggests that most of his supporters did not fall into that category. Effective resistance in any form requires us to accept this as a first step in engaging with these people. And engage we must. We need to understand the fear and frustration that drove so many of our fellow citizens to make that choice. After all, they'll be voting again. Some of those voters are beginning to see the unforeseen impacts of their choice, especially in health care. They're going to get many more such revelations, and so a little compassion might be in order. I'll do my part. Having criticized Trump in personal terms, I'll also reach out to him in personal terms. Mr. President, if you want to resist yourself, and drain your own swamp, I invite you to enroll as a first-year student here at St. Mary's. 
if you actually do the work, you'll finally get the education that you apparently never got at Penn. Now, I'm not knocking your alma mater. You old professors probably did their best with you. But as a spoiled kid in an Ivy League school, you had little incentive to do your best. Given how you think, speak, and act, I'm not sure that you've ever had much incentive to do your best. But it's never too late to change. And St. Mary's is just a couple of hours away from your current home. Since I commute from Silver Spring, I could even drive you back and forth. <laughs> but only on one condition. No talking during the ride. <laughs> I've already heard enough. Thank you.